Did you know that the stomach flu can make you temporarily lactose intolerant? It's true. So in this video, we'll talk about how that happens, and in detail how the small intestine works. So, as a review, once you put food into your oral cavity or your mouth, it's chewed up and then sent down the esophagus, where it ends up in the stomach, where it's churned and then introduced to acid, where it gets broken down into chyme and then delivered into the first part of your small intestine. Now, the small intestine has three different parts to it, so let's take a better look. So the first part of the small intestine is called the duodenum, the duodenum. This receives the chyme that just got processed in the stomach, and it's the part of the entire GI tract where the most digestion occurs. The most breakdown of food products will happen in the duodenum. All right, so the next part of the small intestine is called the jejunum. I'll just write that right here the jejunum, and this is the part of the entire GI tract where the most absorption occurs anywhere. So the most absorption of nutrients is going to happen in your jejunum, the jejunum. Then finally, after your food passes through the jejunum, it gets to the last part of the small intestine, and that's called the ileum, the ileum, I-L-E-U-M, and the ileum. Now this doesn't have a superlative like the most digestion or the most absorption, but there are some pretty important things that are absorbed here. Things like vitamin B12, vitamin A, D, E, K. So there are some important things that are absorbed here. So I'm just gonna write important absorption. There are some important things that are absorbed in your ileum. Now, the busiest part of your small intestine is the duodenum because there are a bunch of things that are involved in this digestion process. So there are four key things to keep in mind. First of all, your stomach is going to be delivering a bunch of chyme or processed food into the duodenum. So you're going to be working with all this chyme here. In addition, you're going to have some stomach acid that process food into chyme that's going to be present in the duodenum. In addition to the stomach, the liver, and the gallbladder are also going to be important to deliver bile to your duodenum. So they give bile. And as I'll talk about in a subsequent video, bile is composed of two different things, bile salts and bile pigments. And beyond the liver and the gallbladder, the pancreas also delivers a couple of very important enzymes for digestion here. So I'm just gonna write enzymes for now, and in a minute I'm gonna go through and talk about which enzymes are delivered by the pancreas. And then finally, the duodenum itself has what are called brush border enzymes. Brush border enzymes that are very important for activation of certain enzymes and also for digestion of several nutrients that we're going to discuss. So let's talk a little more about this brush border. Now if I were to make a little drawing of the duodenum right here, remember that first part of our small intestine, I would draw just this little tube connected right there and then blow up the wall if I want to take a better look at what's going on right there. We would find then that there's a whole bunch of things that just meets the eye. First of all, the wall isn't just a straight line. There's actually a bunch of infoldings that are present on the wall to help increase surface area. Think about it. If we're trying to digest as much as we can here, we need to make sure that there are a lot of projections or a lot of space where we can make contact with the food that's passing by. So if this is the inside of our duodenum and this is the outside, just like how we drew up here, that's in and that's out, you can notice that this wall here has a whole bunch of projections on it. These projections are called villi, V-I-L-L-I, villi, and a single one of them is just called a villus just a single villus. And these are just a couple of folds or these outpouchings that help increase the surface area of our duodenum. Now, that's not where the story ends. If we take a closer look at one of these villi, then we'd find that there are even more projections sitting on that, even smaller microscopic projections. So for this single villus that had a horizontal line right here for its shape, if I were to draw it out here, you would notice that it's not a straight line, but instead, these also have a bunch of projections that are present on them. And if you were to guess why all these projections aren't there, 
I'm sure you would say, to further increase our surface area. That's sort of the name of the game when we're in the small intestine, to increase our surface area. And so these little guys, cutely enough, are called microvilli. Microvilli. And a single one is just called a microvillus. So we've got these villi right here or the single villus that you can see if you just blow up the wall of the duodenum and then if you blow up a single villus you'll find that they have a whole bunch of microvilli that are found on them too to increase our surface area because that allows for better digestion and when we say brush border enzymes these are a whole bunch of enzymes that are present on this brush border because think about it, these villi and these microvilli, they're no different from bristles on a comb. They act to increase surface area or places where you're going to have interaction with food that you want to digest. And so there are enzymes that are present on this brush border. So just to make the point, all of these microvilli and villi together, that's what makes up the brush border of our duodenum. The brush border, which is the increased surface area of the wall, helps to digest food with our brush border enzymes that are present. And as we'll see later in the jejunum, it helps for absorption. So now let's talk about the digestion process in detail. So the best way to talk about the digestion process in the duodenum is to talk about the four major macromolecules that make up everything in our body, starting off with protein. Proteins are just chains of amino acids. So there's one amino acid and here's another amino acid and they're connected by something called a peptide bond. After proteins we also have things that are called carbohydrates. Carbohydrates or our carbs and these are just repeating units of simple sugars attached to each other. Can you name one simple sugar? Yeah, I think you said glucose and so something like glucose attached to, say, galactose, would be a disaccharide. And this particular disaccharide would be called lactose. So a single sugar would be considered a monosaccharide. Two of them, a disaccharide, and then a whole bunch would be a polysaccharide. In addition to our carbs, we also have nucleotides. Nucleotides. And these guys make up our nucleic acid, our DNA and they're composed of three major parts. There's a phosphate group that sits on a ribose sugar that I'm drawing here, this little pentagon. And then right here, you're gonna have a base that's present. And this base is the coding part of your DNA, like adenine or guanine, if you've heard those names before. And then finally, we also have fat. Fat has two parts to it. It's got this triglycerol head that has these three oxygen groups on it. And then each of these oxygens have a fatty acid tail. So there's one, there's two, there's three. So three fatty acid tails that are found here. So now that we know what the main macromolecules are, we can talk about what are the main processes that are involved in breaking these guys up so they can be absorbed into our bloodstream. Starting with our proteins, there's going to be brush border enzymes that are present to help break our peptide bonds or the amino acid amino acid bond that's present and so I'll just write peptidases here peptidases because as you might recall whenever you name an enzyme that ends in ace that means that whatever comes before it is what's broken so a peptide bond is broken by a peptidase in addition the pancreas brings along a couple of important enzymes that'll help break up our proteins first of all it's got trypsinogen that's present as well as some chymotrypsinogen but whenever you see gen at the end of an enzyme's name that means that it's not ready to work yet that means it still needs one more cut or cleavage before it can start being completely functional well this is where our brush border comes in handy again because there's an enzyme that's present on the brush border it's called enteropeptidase enteropeptidase that is specifically present to break down trypsinogen into its active form called trypsin and the same thing with chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin 
these guys are going to be able to break down your peptide bond as well, just like peptidases are able to do, but need a little kick or a little cut in order to start working. And once we gobble up our proteins, we'll have our single amino acid subunits then and be absorbed. When we get to carbs, we'd notice that the pancreas is also pretty helpful here as well because the pancreas releases an enzyme that's called amylase that can help break up the sugar bond or this glycosidic bond is another name for this link right here in certain carbohydrates. The brush border is also helpful here because they have a whole bunch of very specific enzymes that break the glycosidic bond between very specific simple sugars. For instance, the brush border enzyme known as lactase, lactase can only be used to break apart lactose like I've drawn here. Now the interesting thing about lactose that I should mention is that when you get the stomach flu, you've got a bug that's just sitting in your tummy, it actually can start inflaming the duodenal wall. And by doing so, it can knock off some of the lactase brush border enzymes. And so you won't have lactase. You won't be able to break down lactose. You won't be able to separate our glucose from our galactose. And so temporarily, you're going to be lactose intolerant. Most people gain this ability back, but you can understand now how precious these brush border enzymes are to us. And so they'll help break up certain disaccharides. The pancreas will do its job as well. And eventually you'll just have your simple sugars that are going to be left over here. And remember the name for each single unit is called a monosaccharide. A monosaccharide. When it comes to nucleotides, the brush border helps us as well. The specific enzyme set that we have on our brush border that helps break apart nucleotides are called nucleo, wait for it, sidases, nucleosidases. And the reason why we have nucleosidases and not nucleotidases is because it breaks this bond right there, resulting in this phosphate group sticking on the ribose sugar. But now we've got our base as a completely separate unit from the nucleoside. Finally, when it comes to fat, we're gonna get some help from bile, as I mentioned earlier. And bile, if you recall, comes from our liver and our gallbladder. So these guys are gonna release some bile into our duodenum. And they're going to help emulsify or organize our fat. And so I'll write here in parentheses, organize, because they're not really involved in breaking them down. They're there to help organize our fats. One of the main things that help us actually break it down is from the pancreas. The pancreas releases something that's called lipase. And the lipase comes in and cleaves right about there. So that way each of these single fatty acid chains break off. And so you'll have these three fatty acid chains that are hanging out right here, including your triglyceride head that's going to be a separate unit altogether. So now you've got these four things that came off of this one fat molecule. All right, great. So now we have all of our monomers ready to be absorbed. How does the absorption process work? Let's take a look. So now we're so close. We've got all of our monomers, but we need to figure out how the heck are we gonna get them inside of our bloodstream? Well, starting with our amino acids here, these guys are going to be shuttled into cells using what's called primary active transport. Primary active transport. Now if I say primary here, what does that specifically indicate is used? Now you might recall when we use active transport, that means we need a little bit of energy to get something to happen. And the form of energy that we use in primary active transport comes from ATP, the energy unit of life. Adenosine, tri as in three, phosphate. And so if we look at a single enterocyte or an intestinal cell, there'd be a protein that's here on the cell membrane. This protein would break apart our ATP, cleaving off one of the phosphate groups to release adenosine diphosphate, so that's two diphosphate, and in doing so would allow our amino acid to enter into our enterocyte or our intestinal cell. From there, the amino acid can undergo a couple of different steps, but eventually will leave the enterocyte and go to a blood capillary, where it enters the bloodstream and then can be shuttled anywhere else in the body for use. Monosaccharides or sugars sort of have a similar thing going on, 
but instead of primary active transport, we have what's called secondary active transport going on. So if we use ATP for primary active transport, what do we use for secondary? Well, the fact that we're saying this is still active transport means that there was some energy that was used at some point. And the energy actually was invested in setting up an ion gradient. And so the ion gradient then could be used by allowing something like sodium to flow down its gradient to go from a place of high concentration to low concentration where it can relax. And by allowing that to occur, energy is then harnessed, allowing a monosaccharide or a sugar to enter into our enterocyte. And just to make sure we're complete, I'm going to draw the protein transporter we have here, as well as one on the other side, and show that there is a sodium ion that's flowing into our enterocyte down its concentration gradient to end up in the enterocyte with the sugar. And sort of the same thing happens on the other side, except as the sugar leaves, sodium on this side is entering. So the sodium is still flowing down its concentration gradient, but it ends up inside the enterocyte while the sugar leaves and goes to the blood capillary. So this also ends up in our bloodstream and can go anywhere in the body to be used. The nucleoside and the base sort of use the same mechanism that amino acids do, so I'm just going to write primary active transport right here, and you can take a look above to see how that happens. And by doing that, you can imagine where they're going to end up. And that's right, the blood capillary as well. And that takes us to our last macromolecule, fat. Now the thing about fat that's rather redonkulous is that because it's got this really nonpolar tail, if it ever shows up next to an enterocyte like this guy, all it has to do is just diffuse across the membrane. And then it ends up on the inside. In the enterocyte, all of our fatty acids are going to be reorganized into what are called chylomicrons. Chylomicrons. And like the name, chylomicrons themselves are too big to fit directly into a blood capillary. I couldn't even fit it here in this enterocyte. So it doesn't actually directly go into the blood capillary. It is too big to do that. Too big to go to the blood capillary. Instead, chylomicrons will be absorbed into what are called lymphatic, lymphatic capillary, also known as a lacteal, a lymphatic capillary. And these are big enough to accommodate our chylomicrons. Here, they're going to be further digested and broken down into smaller bits. And by the time that happens, they'll end up in veins that will send the digested fat through the heart and eventually to arteries that can then distribute them wherever they need to go in the body. And so you can appreciate a lot that's going on here. We've talked about how all four of our major macromolecules are digested in the duodenum, the place where the most digestion occurs in the GI tract. And now we just talked about how they're absorbed, most likely in the jejunum, right? Because the jejunum is where the most absorption occurs anywhere in the GI tract. And that's how our small intestine works.